Good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you. My name is Patrick Salmon for the purposes of this meeting because our speaker is also called Patrick. And he has very kindly allowed me to call him Paddy and he uh, might call me Patrick. And I'd like, like to make a particular welcome to those of you who are watching us um, from Nicosia, I think in Cyprus, to Rita Severis and I suspect uh, Costas Severis, you're very, very welcome. And to all of you in uh, County Clare or County Limerick or wherever you may be, you're extremely welcome to this, our fourth uh, Zoom meeting since various things have happened to our world. Chronia sas pola. Happy New Year to you, and I wish you very, very good health, especially important in these difficult times we're going through. I'd like to thank especially uh, Theo Zutos, who is working away in the background there, uh, like a duck who's, who's uh, paddling away underwater. We don't see him, but he's there. He's like God, you know, and he's keeping everything under control. Um, this meeting is slightly different from the ones we've had previously, which were in the webinar format. Uh, so after our uh, lecture, we will be able to go into meeting format and uh, talk to each other. And we will then be having something very unusual, which is a virtual vasilopita cutting. But I'll explain that later on. Uh, but there's one for everyone in the audience, but it's only virtual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'd like to um, introduce our speaker, who is a man of very, very many parts uh, from a famous family. And his connection with the Irish Hellenic Society is that his cousin, Patricia Waldron, is on our committee. And Paddy Waldron is somebody who has many, many skills. Uh, he's a, a genealogist at the moment, but in previous lives, he's been an economist. He lectured in Trinity, and he also can say that he was lectured to in mathematics by our founding president, Petros Floridis. And Petros, I wish you to, Chronia Pola. It's a very intriguing title to his lecture because I must confess I knew nothing about Sir Hal Blackall. And Paddy has monopolized the world shares on everything to do with Sir Hal Blackall, apart perhaps uh, from, from the Severuses in Nicosia. But we're all ears, Paddy. Please tell us all you want to tell us about uh, Sir Hal Blackall and Maria, or Maritza, I think she may have also been known, Severis. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paddy. This is the first time I have ever given a Zoom lecture I don't know how to cope with not being able to see the people falling asleep in the front row to tell me I should stop. Um, thank you very much to Paddy and to Theo for setting this up and going over rehearsals with me yesterday. And thanks to the committee, or particularly to cousin Pat for inviting me to speak. When Pat asked, could I give a talk to the Irish Hellenic Society? I said, God, I don't think I'd know about anything that would interest the Hellenic Society. And then I thought of, the Black Holes who ended up in Cyprus and thought of my dear friend Petras, who I first met 40 years ago this year in a first year class in Trinity College. So that's how this lecture came about. It's been postponed because of the pandemic. I haven't been able to do the research that I hope to do, but luckily I've had plenty of material of my own in my own archives uh, to base the lecture on. A very special welcome to Costas and Rita Severus, who are Maria's nephew and his wife listening in from Cyprus, who I made contact with when this was first organized. And Rita said, you'll have to come out and look in our archives as yourself. We have so much material. And then the pandemic happened and my plans to take a holiday in Cyprus last year never came off. Um, and welcome to all the others who are listening around the world. I see names from America, Liverpool, Australia, people with black all ancestry and lots of those places as well. And welcome to all my other friends who've heard about this via Twitter and Facebook. Um, now I have to share my screen so that you can follow some of the, the words. And the other thing I'm gonna do is go into the tech, the chat, and give you the link. All my notes for this talk are on my own website. And if you go into the chat, there is actually a link there now, which you can click on if you want to follow on the website rather than on Zoom, or if you want to go back and follow later on. Um, 
There's a picture of Sir Hal. You'll see some more pictures later on. His full name was Henry William Butler Blackall. Butler was his mother's maiden name. But I think he was known to all as Hal, H-A-L or possibly H-A-L-L as Risa spells it. Uh, let me begin by talking about my connection to the Blackalls or Cousin Pat's connection to the Blackalls. For those of you who know her, I'm going to have to shrink that down a little bit. But here's the Blackall family tree. George Blackall and Marcella Burnell lived in um, Killard, County Clare. They married in 1782. Their son, John McMahon Blackall, poor law guardian, uh, followed them. Their daughter, Catherine, went to Limerick, where she married her distant cousin, Jonas Blackall, a solicitor. Their son, Henry, was another solicitor. And their son, Henry William Butler Blackall, was yet another lawyer. On the other side, in Killard, Marcella Blackall married a local farmer called Hugh Clancy, had a son, George, had a daughter, Mary Ann, who married John McNamara, moved to the other side of Kilkey, who had my grandmother and Pat's grandmother, who married Jack Waldron in Limerick, and they moved to Dublin, where Aidan had Pat and Aidan's brother, another, yet another Paddy, had me. Um, so let me go back to the outline. I'm going to divide the talk about Sir Hal's life into three sections, and I'll zoom that up so that you can see it again. Um, his life before Cyprus, when he met Maria Severus, when he came to Cyprus, and then their married life together. Then I'll talk about his legacy under various headings, and then I'll talk about the roots of the Blackhall family in a little more detail. And... Hopefully I should have gone back to this one before. Um, I have a second connection to the, the Blackhall family. This is the National Library's Parish Registers website. And these are the baptisms for Castle Connell Parish in County Limerick in 1855. And on the 17th of March, down here, we have the baptism of Thomas, son of Thomas Waldron and Catherine Parker of Castle Connell. The baptismal sponsors were Nicholas Blackhall and Catherine Dowling. I think that's Blackhall. Looks like Blackhall with a H. Some people have read it as Blackwell, but I can't find any Blackwells living in the area. But Sir Hal Blackhall had an uncle who was a teenager at this stage and a great uncle who was older, both living around Castle Connell. And this Thomas Waldron is my great grandfather and Pat's great grandfather. And he was born four days earlier on the 13th of March, 1855. And by remarkable coincidence, his two great grandchildren who are here tonight both share his birthday many years later. We won't say how many years later. Um, so both of my grandparents, my grandfather Waldron through his father's godmother and my grandmother McNamara through her Clancy and Blackhall ancestors were connected to the Blackhalls. Uh, as I said, the Blackhalls had deep roots in the legal profession. Uh, Henry Blackhall, the father of Sir Hal. And now I'm going to have to do a little bit of fidgeting because Zoom is getting in the way of what I wanted to show you. Um, that, I hope, is the marriage certificate going to come up on the screen. And again, I should have zoomed down. September the 1st, 1888, at the Church of St. Andrews in Westland Row in Dublin, were married Henry Blackhall, solicitor of 93 George's Street, Limerick, son of Jonas Blackhall. The registrar or the priest was a little confused. He never heard of Jonas. He thought it was Thomas and had to correct it. A solicitor married Isabella Butler, then living in Lower Fitzwilliam Street in Dublin, son of William Butler, a gentleman, but she had been born in Cork and the Butlers were originally from Bonahau near Crusheen in County Clare. Um, Henry's parents, I can show you the full family tree of Sir Hal Blackhall. Henry's parents, as we saw in the other diagram, were Jonas and Catherine. Um, and Jonas was also a solicitor and he had served his apprenticeship with the Barrington family of solicitors in Limerick. You may have heard of Barrington's Hospital. The Barringtons were a very prominent family in Limerick City. And they also owned Glenstall Castle, which was eventually sold to the Benedictine monks to become a very posh boarding school, of which more anon. But Jonas's grandmother was Elizabeth Barrington. Benjamin, Jonas's father, 
died in 1828 when Jonas was a teenager. So things were not looking good. And his Barrington cousins took him in and trained him for the law. And that was how the legal background began. Uh, I also have here Sir Hal's birth certificate. He was born at home at 93 George Street on the 19th of June, 1889, Henry William Butler, uh, son of Henry Blackall, Isabella Emily Butler, solicitor, and his father registered the birth. Uh, he was baptized in St. Michael's Parish. Um, yes, that was just the, the Limerick City Trades Register to point out that the Blackalls were at this address, 93 George Street, since at least 1867. So Sir Hal's grandparents had lived in the same house. There is an extract from the baptism record. The date, I presume, is a date of baptism rather than a date of birth. And this is from rootsireland.ie, which doesn't even give us the baptismal sponsors, but at least confirms he was baptized a Catholic four days after he was born. Um, this is the house in which the family lived for many generations, still there today, as you can see in the upstairs window. It's still a solicitor's office. Uh, but the family lived over the offices in the original days. And if we zoom out, you can see it's a very fine Georgian house in Newtown Perry, the Georgian quarter of Limerick, uh, which developed in the late 1700s and early 1800s on O'Connell Street. As it's now called, it was George's Street at the time that Sir Hal was born. As very, most of you will be familiar with the names of many streets in Ireland changed with independence from the names of British monarchs and such like to the names of Irish patriots like Daniel O'Connell. And it's a different firm today, Joseph Griffin Solicitors. I don't think it's a direct continuation of the Black Call firm. Uh, we find Sir Hal in the census in 1901 at 93 Georgia Street, the house numbers in the census in this case, uh, as will surprise the genealogists in the audience actually coincide with the house numbers used in everyday life. Um, I was interested to see there were three servants in the house, and I'll come back in a minute to the Kilkee connection. You can see that his sister Eva was born in Kilkee and the cook was born in Kilkee. And if we move on to 1911, you'll notice a gap between Henry and Hilda. The second child, Isabel, was missing in the 1901 census. Henry was already studying in Trinity in 1911. They were down to two servants and two more children had been born since 1901. And when I saw this, I was reminded of a lecture I attended many years ago about the great statistician Roy Geary, where the speaker expressed surprise that between the 1901 and 1911 census, every member of the household had actually aged by exactly 10 years. Genealogists will know that it was unusual in those days for people either to know their correct age or even if they knew it, to admit it. This is the census for the Laurel Hill Convent School run by the Faithful Companions of Jesus nuns at uh, Laurel Hill in Limerick City. And these are all the boarding pupils who were there on census night in 1901. And there's Hal's sister, Isabel Blackall, gone to boarding school already at the age of 10. The surprising thing about this is if we look at the map of Limerick, here's Laurel Hill, here's 93 O'Connell Street, and Google tells us it's just 10 minutes walk. So why she had to be a boarder at a school 10 minutes walk from her home at the age of 10, I'm not sure. Um, this was their country house, Garden Hill House, which Sir Hal eventually sold, probably when he decided that he was gonna settle in Cyprus for the rest of his life. Uh, it makes it into the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage, a very fine house dated to somewhere between 1800 and 1840 in the Georgian style, still there today and still in very good condition. And the Blackalls, according to Sir Hal's research, his grandfather Jonas had built another house near Castle Connell. This is just outside Limerick City. Um, Garden Hill House, for those of you who know the, the Dublin Limerick Road, the new M7 motorway is just south of the motorway as you pass the Castle Connell exit and uh, Bloomfield House is just north. It was called Broomfield rather than Bloomfield on the Ordnance Survey maps and the architects estimate it was built between 1790 and 1810. 
Sir Hal says Bloomfield near Castle Connell was built by his grandfather Jonas, who wasn't born until 1812. So there's some slight doubt about the chronology there, whether Sir Hal is the family history wrong or whether the uh, architectural people have dated the house wrong or whether there were two houses called Bloomfield, I'm not sure. Uh, I talked about the Kilkey connection. Uh, we saw that there was a kook age 62 in the 1901 census uh, from Kilkey called Bridget Kerwin. I said, I wonder who she was. Can I find anything about what happened to her afterwards? Did she stay with the family? And she was the only Claire born Bridget Kerwin with lots of use of wild cards in the 1901 census. And this is the only Claire born Bridget Kerwin who was single, the only single Bridget Kerwin in both years, which is only 49 in 1911. I think she's probably the same person. Instead of aging by 10 years, she got younger by 13 years and she'd gone to work as a domestic servant for another family in Limerick City. Uh, so I think that like many families in Limerick City, the Blackwells probably spent their holidays in Kilkee, seaside resort, close to where Sir Hal's grandmother, Catherine Blackwell, had been born and where one of his own sisters was born. And it was quite common for pregnant women to go to Kilkee for the sea air to give birth in, in healthy circumstances in those days. Um, Hal was educated by the Jesuits, like myself. He probably studied classical Greek. I also studied classical Greek. It wasn't my favorite subject. I like to explain that the syllabus of classical Greek in the Irish schools is a bit like teaching people modern English and then giving them Chaucer as their first piece of literature to read because we were asked to read Homer, which had been written about 500 years before the period from which the grammar we were taught had come. Um, this is an old list of pupils of the Crescent School. Um, which is just down the road. I'll show you a map in a second. Um, I managed to get this back from the Wayback Machine. A friend of mine called Catherine McCarthy typed this up about 20 years ago, put it on a website which has disappeared. And you can see John Blackhall in the 1860s, R. Henry studied there from 1900 to 1903. Uh, another John, a Cornelius Jonas, um, and his own father, Henry, is up there. It was one of the very first pupils after the school opened in the Crescent in 1863 to 1866. The Crescent School still exists. There's still a Jesuit involvement, but it has moved from the original premises, which were right in the center of Limerick. It's the Sacred Heart Church. It's still a church, which was the Jesuit church in Limerick. All the religious orders have their own churches in the center or had their own churches in the center of Limerick. The Franciscans up there somewhere have now become the Limerick City Museum. The Dominicans are still down there. The Augustinians are still there. But it was a three minute walk down the main street of Limerick for his first school from 1900 to 1903. Um, and he is still acknowledged by the past pupils union of the Crescent School as a distinguished lawyer alongside our own recent uh, Attorney General and Chief Justice John Murray and other distinguished lawyers educated by the Jesuits in Limerick. Uh, after 1903, when he was 14, we were in the United Kingdom at that stage, the United Kingdom of Ireland and Great Britain. So he was sent off to another Jesuit school, Stonyhurst in Lancashire in England, still there, there today, a very posh public school. When we think of the English public schools, we tend to think of places like Eton that produce uh, British prime ministers, but there are also some very posh Catholic uh, boarding schools. And all his biographies and obituaries refer to Stonyhurst. They don't tend to mention the Crescent, and they don't men tend to mention the school from which he progressed to uh, Trinity College, which we'll see in a minute, was just called St. G's Call Surrey, which I presume is St. George's School in Weybridge, another very posh um, Catholic boarding school in England. So eventually in 1907, um, the year he turned 18, he went to Trinity College. And here, I hope, is the admission register, all in Latin, Henricus Guelmo, Butler, Blackhall, or C for Roman Catholic. And this is not very well digitized. It's split across two images instead of the, the whole opening. Um, I hope you can see that at the top. It's obscured for me by the, the zoom controls. 
Now I can see it, Henry, because I still have to get rid of some other Zoom controls over here so that I can read things. Henrika's father, Henrika's solicitor, aged 18, born in Limerick and educated at St. G. Call, Surrey. So I'm not certain, but I think that's St. George's College in Weybridge. And it's interesting to see a Catholic going to Trinity College in 1907. But in fact, if you look at the history of Trinity, it welcomed Roman Catholics or permitted Roman Catholics to enter and at least take degrees, whatever about scholarships, as early as 1793. If you go down that page, you'll see that there were only two Catholics among the 34 students on the page. But I grew up uh, with two parents who also studied law at the King's Inns and had to get a special dispensation from Archbishop John Charles McQuaid of Dublin to attend their law lectures at Trinity because they were working at the four courts at the time and Trinity was more convenient than University College Dublin. Uh, and in fact, it was only in 1956 that Archbishop McQuaid's ban on attendance at Trinity was extended to all the dioceses. And the minute statutes of that year said that only the Archbishop of Dublin is competent to decide in accordance with the norms of the instructions of the Holy See in what circumstances and with what guarantees against the danger of perversion, attendance at that college may be tolerated. Perversion is a word that has a different meaning today. Uh, converts and perverts were like immigrants and emigrants. A convert was somebody who came into your religion, a pervert was somebody who left your religion. I didn't realize the word was still in use in the 1950s and right up until that ban was lifted in the 1970s. So I don't know how welcome a Catholic from Limerick felt in Trinity College in 1907, but probably more welcome than he would have felt in 1956 when his own archbishop would be telling him it was a mortal sin to go there. That ban was eventually lifted in 1970. So when I started attending Petros's lectures in 1981, I was only in the, the 12th class in which Catholics were allowed into Trinity without uh, condemnation from the hierarchy. So Henry took firsts in history and law, won every possible law prize and scholarship in Trinity. I don't know whether he got one degree or two. He's usually described just as BA. Most degrees in Trinity are BA, whatever the subject. And he may also have had a separate LLB degree. And if there wasn't a pandemic and I'd been in Dublin, I could have just popped into the Berkeley Library and checked the uh, books with lists of graduates, but wasn't able to do that this year. And if you go back to um, the first page, you will see I have the description from Ferguson's book on Irish barristers, uh, listing all Henry's jobs, etc. I'll come back to that later on. There was a class of 11. Uh, well, he went on, he went on in 1909. That's the other surprise. Nowadays, uh, people tend to finish their four-year degrees at university before they go to the King's Inns to study to become barristers. He only started in Trinity in 1907. He was admitted to the King's Inns in 1909. He was called to the bar in 1912. He was in first place in his class at the King's Inns. A small class of 11 men, all men. Women were not allowed to be barristers until after the Sex Disqualification Removal Act was passed about a decade later. But there was an interesting man in his class, another genealogist, Cecil Stackpool Kenny. Um, and sadly, Cecil was killed in the First World War in 1915. He was from Limerick too. His father was a solicitor and practiced at 55 O'Connell Street, which is directly across the road from 93 O'Connell Street where the Blackholes lived. So we can probably assume that Cecil and Hal Blackhall were lifelong friends at home in Dublin at the King's Inns and doing their genealogical research in the public record office and other places. And the National Library has two years worth of Cecil Stackpool Kenny's genealogy. And unfortunately, his genealogical research was ended by his death in World War I. And there's lots of other papers on the Stackpool Kenny family. And for some reason, the genealogy stuff is listed separately in the catalog. Sir Hal also signed up uh, for the First World War. 
Uh, we don't know what he did in the two years between his call to the bar in 1912 and the outbreak of the war in 1914. I half suspect that he took a gap year in order to do genealogy because his first volume of genealogical notes and records is dated 1913. And when he published his first article on the Blackall family history, he included a transcript of a grant of lands to his ancestors, which he had made in the public record office in Dublin in 1913. And the significance of that and much of his other work is that in the Irish Civil War in 1922, uh, the public record office was occupied by the Republican side and bombarded by the Free State side. And each blames the other for the fact that it went up in smoke with the loss of many centuries of Irish historical records, many of which thankfully Hal Blackall and others had consulted. Um, in the First World War, he was in the South Irish horse, and then he became a second lieutenant in the Cheshire Regiment. This is the medal card, which shows he was awarded the Victory Medal, one of the medals awarded to all those who took part on the British side in the First World War. And it gives us two addresses where he lived, presumably after the war when his medals were being sent out, Nine Cavendish Road, South Sea, Hampshire, and Belvale Lodge, Gateacre near Liverpool. And it's not clear which came first because South Sea is number one and Gateacre is number two, but um, number two is struck out and number one is not struck out. So eventually he had to get a job and he joined the colonial civil service. And I suppose we can say Ireland was still part of the United Kingdom at that stage and it's not too surprising that uh, somebody with a law degree from Trinity and the King's Inns would go and work in the colonial service. Uh, Ferguson's book and the Barristers reminds us that the King's Inns has always educated many more students than chose to join the law library. And he has a list of barristers who took part in the First World War and Sir Hal is not on that list. So we can assume that he did not go straight into practice in the courts in Dublin. But Ferguson also says that many graduates of the King's Inns will have been reconciled to going abroad. From the late 19th century, Irish barristers regularly took up colonial appointments. In 1909, the Bar Council in Dublin took credit for having brought before the colonial office the claims of the Irish Bar to a share in the appointments to colonial legal offices, and with the assistance of the Attorney General of Ireland, were enabled to secure that the same notification of vacancies should be given to the Irish Bar as is given to the various inns of court in England, and these notices have since been sent to the Under Treasurer of the King's Inns, who has forwarded them to the Secretaries of the Bar Council to be posted in the library. That was an announcement in the Law Times and Solicitor's Journal in 1909. Uh, so we can take it that Sir Hal was at a loose end after his war service and couldn't afford to do genealogy full time for the rest of his life. So he joined the Colonial Legal Service and his first appointment was as Crown Counsel in Kenya, where as a young barrister at the age of 30 on his first job, he was appointed a member of the Legislative Council of Kenya in 1920. This was not a very democratic appointment. He was just one of the colonial officials who was appointed to run the place. But what we have here from Wikipedia is the results of the first election to the Legislative Council, which took place a matter of months later. He was not a candidate for the election, uh, but he continued to work as a Crown Council in Kenya until 1923, when he was sent on to Nigeria. He spent nine years in Nigeria, and then he was sent on to Cyprus, where in 1932, in his early 40s, he was appointed Attorney General. And that's where he met Maria. And uh, thanks to Costas and Rita and their Sivar Severus Foundation Facebook page, we know a little bit about his early life in uh, Cyprus. And if you look down at the bottom of that page, you will see his description of Cyprus on his arrival in 1932. He went for a walk around the city with Thomas, whoever Thomas was, 
the cathedral built by the Crusades is now a mosque and being Ramadan, we could not enter inside. Nicosia is a regular Eastern city. The different houses being together, each of their own part of the bazaar. It is certainly incomparably more interesting than a place like Lagos. That's Lagos in Nigeria, where he had lived for the previous nine years. So maybe Rita can tell us later how he came to meet Maria or Maritza. We know very little about her. His obituaries merely describe her as his charming and capable wife. She was the daughter of Demosthenes Severus, who was the chairman of the Bank of Cyprus. And she was almost 20 years younger than him. Here they are on a passenger list in August 1945, an interesting time to be at sea uh, in the Atlantic. They left Trinidad where he was working at that stage and they were going first to New York. And we see that Lady Maria, as she then was, was only 36 and Sir Henry William Butler Blackall was 56. So when they married in 1934, he was about 45 and she was about 25. He was the Chief Justice of Trinidad born in Limerick, she was born in Nicosia, and they were en route back to Britain. And if you look at the dates, it took seven days to get from Trinidad to New York. I didn't realize it was as far as it is from New York to Ireland, which typically took seven days on these liners. And he was going to his sister who was living in England, Mrs. Rickman. She was going to her mother in Cyprus. And the day they set sail was the day after the first atomic bomb in Japan and while they were at sea we had the second atomic bomb so I guess we had uh, peace in Europe already at that stage but the war was still going on in Japan and they were carrying on their colonial duties crossing the Atlantic by ship as if maybe nothing was happening. Uh, again thanks to Rita for the photo of the wedding group. Um, I think that's Hal with his wig and gown, his legal outfit, which I didn't think lawyers wore on the wedding days, but apparently he did. And this is a diary entry from the best man, Rupert Gunnis, who says we went to Blackall's house and collected him and then to the Tripiotis church where Lloyd Carson and I were his Kumbaros, whatever language that is. Uh, Blackall, rather a bewildered and pathetic sight with a crown on his head then all to the Severus house for the reception, very good food and champagne and masses of people. Lee of the Financial Commission, a very common but nice little man. Um, so they were left in Cyprus for another two years. And then his next post was in Ghana, as it's now called, or the Gold Coast, as it was known in those days, where he was the Attorney General. Again, he was made a member of the Executive Council. There's the Wikipedia page telling you about the administration. It was a small advisory body of European officials. They were not elected, and they were also members of the Legislative Council, which did include uh, some others, even some Africans. Uh, so colonialism was not quite as strict as when he had been in Kenya. He was the deputy to the governor in the Gold Coast in 1940. And in 1943, he was appointed the Chief Justice of Trinidad and Tobago and the president of the West Indian Court of Appeal. And some of the biographies say he stayed in those positions until 1948. But in 1946, he'd been appointed the Chief Justice of Hong Kong. I can't really see a man administering justice in Hong Kong and the West Indies at the same time. Uh, but maybe there's some explanation for that. But he went back then to West Africa to be the president of the West African Court of Appeal from 1948 to 1951. And retired in 1951 to Kyrenia in Cyprus, his wife's home city. But he made almost annual visits to Dublin during the 1950s and 1960s. And when he was in Dublin, he went to the public record office every day to carry on his genealogical researches. He was also very involved in the Irish Genealogical Research Society uh, over in, based over in London. It now has an Irish branch. It used to meet at the Irish Club in Eaton Square in London. And certainly in 1953, he lectured on the butlers of County Clare in London to that society. Um, he remained in Kyrenia until after the Turkish occupation in 1974, and he corresponded with many other genealogists and relatives, distant cousins in Ireland. One of them was the famous essayist Hubert Butler from County Kilkenny, 
This is Hubert's obituary, which he published in the Journal of the Butler Society after Sir Hal died. And I like the, the last paragraph told us a little bit about life in Cyprus. He says his wife, who predeceased him, she died 10 months before him, came of a distinguished Cypriot family. They had a beautiful house at Kyrenia, and I cherish a letter that he wrote me after the Turkish occupation, when he had to abandon it and move to Greek Nicosia. He wrote with marvellous nonchalance about his loss and gave such a vivid understanding description of the Greco-Turkish struggle that I asked if I could print it in the journal. He said, no, it has nothing to do with the butlers. That is, of course, true. Yet now that he is gone, I wish it had been published. It would have been a memorial to a very old man who could face misfortune with sang froid and detachment. Uh, he was still going strong even in his 80s. Um, he was a member also of the Thomond Archaeological Society based in Limerick. And that was the society that had published his genealogical work on the butlers. And he wrote to the editor of the journal in 1977, complaining of loss of memory from old age being 88, but offering the journal a pedigree of the Omal Vihels, something which never materialized. He was listed as a member of that society in their journal in 1979, living at 7 Halkidan Street in Nicosia. And Maritza, even though she was 20 years younger than him, died first on the 1st of January 1981. And Rita Severus, her nephew's wife, who's here listening tonight, has told me she, Maritza died in her arms. And Hal died 10 months later, the 1st of November 1981, aged 92, 69 years to the day after he'd been called to the bar in Ireland. So to talk about his legacy, uh, there are a number of obituaries which I've been able to draw on for this talk. There's a biography in Wikipedia, which I may go in and edit at some stage. I've already shown you uh, Hubert Butler's obituary in the Journal of the Butler Society, the Irish Genealogist, the Journal of the Irish Genealogical Research Society, also published an obituary, uh, which is there, which was written over the initials HDG, which I presume is Hubert Darrell Galway, who was the editor of that journal and also his collaborator on the history of the Galway family. As you may have noticed on the family tree, his maternal great-grandmother was a Margaret Galway. And there were actually two Galway families in Ireland one in the north and one in the south. And his conclusion was that the ones in the north took their name from Galloway in Scotland. And the ones in the south took their name from Galway in the west of Ireland. That was disputed. And I think that he and his obituarist were from different branches of the Galway family, but they'd worked together in trying to tie the two families together. Uh, there's another obituary which appeared in the London Times. Again, Zoom is getting in the way of uh, jumping from one page to the other. And that should bring up the London Times obituary, um, which tells us all about his degree at Trinity, where after taking first in history and law, he proceeded to win every possible law prize and scholarship. Very rightly did his college honour him when uh, he received his knighthood by also giving him an honorary Doctor of Laws, LLD. And it also says that in the First World War, as well as serving in the Cheshire Regiment, he served in the RAF, the Royal Air Force, which was only established in 1918 in the closing months of the war. But there didn't seem to be any mention of that on his medal card. So I'm not too certain. There's also an obituary in the North Munster Antiquarian Journal, which I quoted earlier by Edward MacLyset another famous journalist who was even older than him. MacLyset was born in 1887 and was still writing obituaries of his friends at the age of 95. Uh, Hal got his knighthood in the 1945 New Year's honours list, a knight bachelor with a long list of people who got knighthoods for their work in the UK, three for their work in the Dominions, more for their work in India, and then a short list of people who worked in the colonies, protectorates, etc., including Henry William Butler Blackall. Uh, when he got his honorary degree in Trinity, he was, it was reported in the Clare Champion, the local newspaper in County Clare, uh, from where his ancestors 
or where his ancestors had lived for many generations. And is uh, described him as grandson of the late William Butler of Bunnahow, a former high sheriff of this county, County Clare, and as being a collateral descendant of the famous Clare lawyer, Sir Toby Butler, who was MP for Ennis in the historic parliament of 1689 and solicitor general to King James II and actually drafted the Treaty of Limerick. He was a great, 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 great nephew of Sir Toby Butler, but apparently was very proud of him. Um, and I didn't quite know what collateral descendant meant until I looked at the pedigree and worked that out. The Irish Genealogical Research Society made him a fellow in 1969. He'd been publishing in their journal from 1941, right up until his last article appeared after he had died in 1981. He drafted the rules of that society when the founder, Father Wallace Clare, died in 1963, and he was the vice president from 1964. He was also vice president of the Butler Society, Society for Those with Butler Ancestry. I thought for a while of trying to put together a complete list of his publications, but there were just too many. Um, there's a few listed in my notes. And one of the most substantial pieces of work he did was the Butlers of County Clare, which was originally published in the North Monster Journal, was republished as a standalone volume and has been republished again now on the internet by the Clare County Library, which has a fantastic genealogy website. Uh, later on, he privately published a typewritten history of the Blackall family of Limerick, Dublin and Clare by Sir Henry Blackall. And you see the titles that he was most proud of were QC, Queen's Council, LLD, his honorary doctor of laws and his fellow of the Irish Genealogical Research Society. And my copy of that is a photocopy of a photocopy which started out at the Cork County Library. And there's his signature when he completed that and presented it to the library on the 5th of April, 1971. It was self-published, but not in the sense of something that's printed on demand off the internet, something that was probably hand typed and sent by him to a few select repositories, not even including the Clare County Library was it got its copy from the Cork County Library. I presume he's also responsible for the Blackhall entry in Burke's Irish Family Records in 1976, which I also have here somewhere. He was the head of the family at the time uh, and listed all his own achievements. And this is not infallible. There's a little piece that I've highlighted down here about the children of his great great grandparents George Blackall and Marcella Burnell who he says had two daughters Catherine married to Owen Keane and another daughter whose name he didn't know married to James Mulvihill. Other pedigrees say yes there was a daughter married to Owen Keane, there was a daughter married to James Mulvihill, there was a daughter called Catherine but they were one and the same. Her first husband died and she remarried uh, and we will see a little later he has left out their daughter Marcella who married Hugh Clancy my ancestor. So perhaps he heard there were two daughters. He heard about Mrs. Keane, he heard about Mrs. Mulvihill, and he just assumed that they were different people and that he had accounted for all the daughters. I'll come to the evidence that proves that Marcella existed later. Uh, he had no issue. His only brother, George Jonas Butler Blackall, known as Friday, uh, we'll come to later on, he had no issue either. There were three sisters who survived him. They all died in 1986. So he had three nephews and one niece. So there are much closer relatives than me still alive. I don't know them and uh, they're not black holes. I have a couple of old Irish telephone directories in 1985 and the, the Quidado directory covering everywhere outside Dublin, there was just one black hole. And in a later 1994 directory, there was just one black hole in Dublin city. And the surname appears to have been practically daughtered out in Ireland. So at least John Blackall, who's listening from Liverpool, is still keeping it going across the water. And there are one or two uh, male Blackalls still alive in Ireland. It's, it, it may survive. Uh, his other legacy is the substantial archives that he has left in several places. In his obituary by Edward MacLyset, MacLyset reports that Blackall gave him his original record of his researches on the Blackall family and there in the National Library of Ireland Manuscripts Department. Uh, when I first 
started looking into his genealogical work way back almost 30 years ago now, I discovered that Father Mark Tierney of the Benedictine Order, who, uh, since deceased, who was at Glenstall Abbey, the, the school that was originally the Barrington family home, was describing himself as Sir Hal's literary executor. And he got custody of seven boxes of genealogical papers, and he has deposited them in the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin, where I have consulted them. Um, they're not very well organized. There are five large manuscript volumes of genealogical notes and records. I should have a photograph of them. I never thought to take a photograph and couldn't get back in because of the pandemic to take one. Um, but they're bigger than family Bibles. And volumes one and two are in box four, volumes three and five are in box one, and volume four is in box five. And the rest of the material is equally all over the place. So one could spend a lifetime. You spent 70 years compiling them. You could spend 70 years studying them. Uh, Costas and Rita Severus, who are listening in, run the Centre of Visual Arts and Research in Nicosia, and they have Sir Henry's diaries from 1929 to 1980 and many, many photographs. And we have just a few of these photographs which they have put up on Facebook recently. There's a more formal picture of Sir Hal in his legal attire. Uh, there he is with Maritza attending a public event. And there is one of the houses in which he lived in, in Kyrenia. Somebody can explain to me later whether that's White Arches, as I have it from some English language source, or Ada Kiftlik, maybe the, the Greek equivalent of that name. I'm afraid my knowledge of ancient Greek doesn't extend to modern Greek. Uh, his papers relating to his time in the colonial service are at Rhodes House in the Oxford University Libraries. And I discovered just this afternoon that they were the source material for a very recent thesis at City University of New York um, on the dilemma of the British in the Gold Coast, 1874 to 1944. And he is mentioned frequently in that thesis. Another interesting person that he had a lot of parallels to is Sir Paget John Burke, born in 1906, died in 1983, called to the Irish Bar in 1928, uh, married a lady from Kilrush called Doris Killeen, a second cousin once removed to Sir Hal, and joined the British colonial service, even though he had been trained in law in the now independent Irish Free State. And Sir Paget also ended up in Cyprus, where he was Chief Justice from 1957 to 1960. Knighthood came with being a Chief Justice in these places. And his family are also quite notable in Ireland. He had a niece, Mary Theresa Winifred Burke, who we know better by her married name, Mary Robinson, who was President of Ireland from 1990 to 1997. So she had connections to Cyprus as well, and connections to the Black Holes. Uh, so Sir Hal performed an invaluable service to all of us connected to the Black Holes by his 70 years of genealogical work. And as I mentioned already, what was especially important was so much of that was carried out in the public record office adjoining the four courts in Dublin before it was destroyed in 1922. I hope that the people behind this Beyond 2022 project to create Ireland's virtual record treasury um, and to try and gather together as many copies as possible of the items that were lost in 1922 have been going through Sir Hal's papers in the Royal Irish Academy to see what they contain that is now lost. A um, couple of interesting quotes from his obituaries. He was reluctant to express doubt in his genealogical work by using such words as probably or possibly or such expressions as may have been. He preferred to give a judicial verdict on the evidence available. This legal approach sometimes let him down when fresh facts later came to light. I'll come back to that in the last few minutes. And um, to those who may be reluctant to publish anything that is not perfectly researched, that felt like I was reading about myself, with the result that nothing ever appears, he'd like to quote the adage, the best is the greatest enemy of the good. Uh, the Black Holes he described as being Cromwellian landed gentry, but essentially they were Catholic middlemen. Uh, his distant relative, George Blackall, the Lord Mayor of Dublin, 
in a letter in 1694, stated in no uncertain terms that the family came from Devon. Uh, in his article on the Burnells and the Penal Laws, he wrote about some of his ancestors who were not entirely Catholic. His great, great, great grandfather, Christopher Burnell, lived in Ranahan County Clare and was considered a papist. And all his children, according to the case under the Penal Laws, were so trained. He was a victim of the Popery Act of 1703, whereby an undutiful son, on becoming a Protestant, could prevent his popish father from providing for his Catholic offspring. So in 1763, Henry Burnell initiated proceedings against Christopher Burnell, Mary, his wife, who was Henry's stepmother, and James Butler, who was her nephew. Henry was the eldest son, the only son of the first marriage of his father. And when he expressed a desire to become a Protestant, his father and stepmother threatened to maintain him no longer. So he took proceedings against them. He alleged that they had made a treaty for James Butler to buy their estate at Ranahan in trust for their children, his half siblings. And Christopher admitted that he had made over his estate by a deed registered in January, 1763. So that was very common in the penal times. If Catholics had land that they were in danger of losing, they would find a friendly Protestant and register the land in the name of the friendly Protestant. But in this case, the son tried to throw out his parents and his half siblings. And the butlers of Bonahau were Catholic, but they were the only branch of the enormous butler dynasty that remained Catholic. So finally, let's come back to Killard, where Sir Hal's grandmother came from, uh, where my great grandmother came from. It was one of the places that was very badly affected by the Great Famine in the 1840s. Here you see a sketch that will probably be very familiar from the Illustrated London News of uh, 1850, showing the devastation, the roofless houses after evictions in Killard. And in that article, which is also available from the Clare Library website, uh, the writer seemed to confuse the townland of Killard, which was the Blackpool estate with the much larger parish of Killard, where there were many different landlords. So he said, it is chiefly the property I understand of Mr. John McMahon Blackall, whose healthy residence is admirably situated on the brow of a hill, protected by another ridge from the storms of the Atlantic. His roof tree yet stands secure, but the people have disappeared. The village was mostly inhabited by fishermen who united with their occupation on the waters, the cultivation of potatoes. When the latter failed, it might have been expected that the former should have been pursued with more vigor than ever, but boats and lines were sold for present subsistence and to the failure of the potatoes was added the abandonment of the fisheries. The rent dwindled to nothing and then came the leveler and the exterminator. Um, And if I, I'm almost finished, so we'll go back to first page. How did I discover the proof of my connection to the Black Holes, which had been handed down orally from this article, which appeared in the Limerick and Clare Examiner in October 1849, uh, signed by John McMahon Blackall, talking about the house leveling, which took place within the last 12 months and what he terms his son's portion of Killard. Hugh and Thomas Clancy were evicted, the father and son, they never paid rent. Hugh Clancy was married to the sister of Mr. Blackall and got the place in right of his wife from old George Blackall deceased. So we know from other documents, Hugh's wife was Marcella Blackall. And we know from that newspaper article that the tradition that she was the son of old, Jar the daughter of old George Blackall is absolutely correct. The Blackall lands descended to a Miss Massey Blackall who never married. And at the end of her life, she wanted the farm to remain in the Blackhall name. And she actively encouraged her niece, Nancy Blackhall, in her, her relationship with Sir Hal's brother, who was known by his nickname, Friday Blackhall. It was the name of a racehorse he once owned, I'm told. They were second cousins and they eventually did marry after Miss Massey died, but he was 44, she was 41. There were no issue and they sold up in 1963 and moved to Dublin. And that was the end of the Blackhalls in West Clare. Uh, through the butlers, Sir Hal was actually a ninth cousin twice removed of the present Queen of England. Both of his parents and her mother were descendants of the 11th Earl of Ormond. And finally, 
we're starting to use modern technology to research the black hole family history. And John, who's listening from Liverpool, has had his Y chromosome analyzed. He's got no matches who are black holes, but he has matches with surnames like Black Ledge, Black Lidge, and Blackler. So evidently, uh, the name has evolved in different ways in the many centuries since surnames were first established, and Black Hole is just one branch of a bigger dynasty. So thank you all very much for listening. I hope I haven't gone too far over time. I've done it in less than an hour. I was told to do 45 minutes. And I'm happy to answer any questions. And let's see if I can figure out how to get back onto Zoom and see what else is happening. Anyone else able to talk to me out there? Yes, indeed, Paddy. Thank you very, very much. Um, I can see that you inherited the genealogy bug. <laughs> yeah, very, very definitely. Absolutely. Can, can I ask you, when did you first become aware of Sir Hal Blackall? I think it was back in my teenage years, which would have been in the 1970s. Uh, my aunt, Kit Waldron had a brother-in-law, Paddy Dalton, who was a member, I think, of the Irish Genealogical Research Society. And he gave me a copy of Sir Hal's first 1941 article on the Black Holes. And uh, a few years after that, my father, as I mentioned, was a barrister and we used to go on holidays to West Clare and all the locals would come to him with their legal problems. And there was a gentleman by the name of Jim Coughlin, who we didn't even know, but was a friend of a friend and had some legal problem and was sent to visit my father for legal advice. And it turned out that his mother-in-law was a black hole descendant. And I think was living with him and was about 90 and talked incessantly about the black holes. And I still have the sheet of paper where Jim wrote out what he knew of the black hole family history from his mother-in-law, including Sir Hal of Cyprus. And, uh, I just kept going from there and it was probably about the early 90s when I discovered his papers in the Royal Irish Academy in 1993 when I first went to look at them and I've been back a couple of times since but could spend my whole retirement there trying to make sense of them. Well thank you very thank you very much. Please read it please. Thank you very much for this interesting lecture Brought brought back lots and lots of memories of Uncle Hal and uh, Auntie Maritza. Um, I must admit, I didn't know much, so much about his gene uh, genealogy, about his ancestors. Um, although I ended up one day after Uncle Hal died, I went home and I found in my entrance hall a pile of books that came and what was dumped on my floor uh, when they were cleaning out the house. So I ended up with all these books, which I kept for years and years and years, and manuscripts of ge uh, on genealogy, on the butlers and on the black holes, etc. which I must admit, shame on me, I never read. But um, a lot of them I had to finally give away because I didn't have space. I still have a few just to remind me of him and of Auntie Maritza. And I'm very willing to show you, Patrick, whenever you manage to visit Cyprus, because there, there's a whole bunch of manuscripts as well. Good, good. I look Apart forward to getting, getting there when the world returns to normal. <laughs> exactly. Apart from the, the, the diaries. You ask how they met. Yes. They met at Blatres, at a hotel um, up, uh, up in uh, the mountains, in the Trudos Mountains in Cyprus, where it seems that uh, uh, Hal uh, used to go for his holidays, maybe from Kenya, because they met, uh, I think, in 1929. And um, in fact, he... Uh, he liked another girl to begin with, a Cypriot girl, and was after her. And then he, he noticed Maritza and changed his mind and started uh, flirting with Maritza, who was 
In fact, he was one year younger than his mother-in-law. Two, two, two years younger two year, than his mother. Two his years mother. younger than his mother-in-law. And uh, Demosthenes Severis, his father-in-law, would not hear of a marriage. He was very, very much against it. Uh, the difference in age, A and B, uh, a Brit, not a Cypriot, at that time, it was anathema. But she, Maritza was a formidable lady. I mean, a real character, and she was out. If she wanted something, she would get it. And she persuaded everybody that this is what she was going to do. She was going to marry Hal. And everybody had to step back and allow it. Mm -hmm. Great. It's, it's wonderful to get some first-hand information at long last after 40 years of wondering about this man. Yeah. And he lived in the, the house they lived in to begin with in Karinia was Adachi Flik. That's Turkish. Ada means island in Turkish. And Chiflik um, means, uh, refers to a state or a farm, a large farm, an estate. And it's because it was a huge piece of land that belonged to Maritza. Uh, and it was just under St. Hilarion Castle. They built this, this house. Uh, Adachi Flick uh, Island, because on the border of the land, there were two streams, left <clears throat> and right. So it was like, a, like an island. And then when, uh, the, after 1963, when the first uh, trouble started, and there was a lot of militia in the area near St. Hilarion Castle, after that, they moved out to Carinia to the family house, which was called White Arches. You mentioned White Arches. Yes. Uh, White Arches was the house uh, down in Carinia overlooking the harbor. This is a lady speaking from Cyprus. Go on, go on. Ask me anything else I would like to hear. Oh God, that's that's wonderful to, to hear all of that. <laughs> and Kumbaros, you asked what does Kumbaros means? Kumbaros means first man, and his Kumbaros was uh, Rupert Ganis, ADC to Sir Ronald Stores. Um, and uh, Hal was uh, very close to Rupert Ganis and to Ronald Stores. And they were quite uh, often invited to government house at the time it was called, but the presidential palace was called government house. And in fact, um, during, uh, during that period, there was a time that uh, uh, the Greeks were uh, doing passive resistance against the, colon uh, the British. And they would not accept invitations by the British. They would not go to government house. But Maritza, with Hal, went and in fact danced the reels. And the next day it was in the newspapers. And her father wouldn't get out of the house. He was so embarrassed. He wouldn't get out of the house for days. So she was a rebellious young lady. Oh, yes, she oh, was. Yes, in every way. Yes. And I wonder how easy was it for him to get a transfer from uh, Kenya to Cyprus when he decided he wanted to, to court her? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't know. I know that he was... Um, <laughs> they, they lived a very, a very good marriage together, but they had separate, separate uh, pockets. Each one looked after their own uh, income. They never did anything jointly financially. And uh, he was very tight. He was extremely tight. Oh dear. Yeah. Just to remember. <laughs> <coughs> Paddy, can you hear me? Yeah. I have a little anecdote I'd like to share. Is that okay? Yeah, I can't even tell who's speaking now. Oh, it's John Blackhawk John, from Liverpool. How are you? Go on. Uh, the one who's related to the royal family. Yeah. Um, well, I was out in Cyprus in uh, 1958 
was a young lad, age 18 in the army. And I ended up on uh, orders one day, the colonel's orders for me and I was a bounce. There was about four of us. And the colonel asked me the strangest question. He said, are you any relation to General Blackall? Well, I didn't have a clue. I started my ancestry only in the last, say, 15 years. Didn't really have a clue. And I said, I'd never heard of him, sir. But lately, later, of course, I found out that he was talking about Sir Hal Blackall. Because they all ganged together them in those days, colonels, generals, you know. And since then, I actually bought a place out in uh, in, it was in the north, uh, just outside Carinia. And I used to go down there most days to Carina, and I must have walked past that house, Rita, many times, you know. I, I even thought I recognised it there when I seen the picture of it that Paddy put up. Um, so I, I was very familiar, but he was, he was a very interesting man. And when I did develop an interest, I actually didn't realise he, he'd moved to Nicosia. Um, and I thought perhaps he, he died in, in, in Carinia. And I went around the graveyard there, the graveyards, looking for him. I spent a few hours. Very sad picture, too, because a lot of them, which this is only, what, about 10 years ago, and a lot of the gravestones had been, you know... Um, knocked over and broken, vandalised. And um, we never found, it was only after we spent a few hours there, we found there was a list on the wall with the names of everybody <laughs> buried in the graveyard, you know. But um, yeah, I just thought I'd share that with you because he's obviously somebody who was, uh, I, I, I can't help but think that when the colonel asked me that, that he'd been prompted by say how, you know, uh, black hole in your regiment, ask him if he's, uh, if he knows <laughs> I it's suspect. A, anyway, thank you. It's a pity. It's a pity he didn't arrange an introduction for you. Yeah, I, yeah. I suspect you'll be the first one visiting uh, Rita's archives if you have a oh, place yes. in Cyprus yes. already. And Rita, I presume you know where he's buried. Yes, um, he died in Nicosia from a fall. Actually, he fell from his bed uh, early in, uh, morning hours and hit his head. This is how he died, and he's buried in the uh, Latin cemetery in Larnaca. In Larnaca, there's a special cemetery where uh, Roman Catholics are, are, are buried. And Sir Henry is buried there. Maritza is buried in uh, our, in uh, the family grave in Nicosia. And I presume she much. was Greek I, Orthodox, I was she? Like it, it was there, it was only a village then, I think. Yeah. Excuse me? I remember it as a village, Larnaca. I was there a few times, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not a village anymore. Not anymore, no. <laughs> no. At the airport. Yeah. Um, the, 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 Latin, the cemetery is near the church of St. George uh, the Near, as you enter Larnaca. Thank you. Uh, my father-in-law had arranged for that, I think, yes. Yeah. Because at the time, actually, he wanted to be buried in the British cemetery in Carinia. And now I remember. But at the time, it was after the invasion, and they had moved over to Nicosia, and they wouldn't give us permission to take him to Carinia to be buried. So father-in-law buried him in uh, in Larnaca. In the had he continued to be a practicing Catholic? A, a Catholic, yes, practicing. Uh, practicing, no. I don't think so. No, 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 no. not really, no. I never remember Hal going to church. He, he, I mean, he never talked about religion. I never heard him talk about religion. Um, no, no I think he was quite distant. Even at the, till the end of his life, he was a sort of colonialist, imperialist type of person, you know, and he had a very strict program. Six o'clock, it was pink jeans. Uh, if you were invited to the house, you were going to sit where Hal told you to sit, and you couldn't move from your chair unless he asked you to move. I mean, there were all, all these things, and you will meet and speak with so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so will meet and speak with so-and-so. I mean, he was ruling everything. Although he always depended on Maritza. He was a kitten when Maritza entered the room. <laughs> Turned into a kitten. Good. 
one, one, one of his quotes that I, I remember when you said uh, a name, do, do I know him? Uh, no. Should, should I know him? <laughs> I quite like that. Should, should I know him? <laughs> and, uh, he, I think he lived in his own world in a way yeah. because uh, uh, he did, uh, didn't have children, so it was different. And he, and he never ever learned Greek. Yeah. His Greek was just uh, thank you and hello. That, that was it. No. And, and, and during the last months, especially after he lost Maritza, who he depended so much on Maritza, uh, he, he, he started forgetting and, and losing his mind. A well, bit. In, in, in yeah, and he was quite elderly, uh, quite oh. old as well. Um, and I remember he used to call me. He was very close to me after Maritza died. Some, for some reason, from all the family, he got stuck on to me. And I remember he used to call me three o'clock in the morning. Where's my Cyprus mail? His newspaper. Three o'clock in the morning. I say, Uncle, I'll, the driver will bring it over at eight o'clock. No, I want my Cyprus mail now. <laughs> so twice I had to get up, go to the newspaper, get the fresh printed, newly printed <laughs> newspaper and take it to house apartment. Otherwise he wouldn't stop calling. We, we'll all get to that stage when we're in our <laughs> 90s. Yeah, exactly. my, my late father was the same. He started calling me at three in the morning when he was in yeah, his 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and despite all his faults, I can tell you we're fond of him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You must come to Cyprus, I'll show you. You should read his diaries. I will have and, to, yes. And, yes. and masses of pictures, masses of pictures. And, uh, and there are a lot of people in the pictures which I can't recognize. I don't know who they are. Okay, Robert Canis and stores. Yeah, man, I don't want to send yeah. a message to Patricia. But the rest, I, I, I wouldn't know. So, you know, so maybe, maybe you can recognize some people. That's They're true. foreign people. Maybe They're not Cypriots. Yeah, it's one of them. I must try yeah. and get in touch with his nephews and nieces and their descendants. Their the nephews and nieces are possibly all dead by now. And I, I, his sisters are dead, I think. Yeah. But he had a nephew who inherited him. Uh, I can't remember his he, name. He, he had a, a, a niece with which he corresponded. I think from all his family, there was a niece. I don't a niece or a nephew? A niece. But there was an nephew that inherited him. I don't know. Yeah. But he definitely he had a niece with which he corresponded. He had a he nephew, was... Cecil, in Canada, who I know oh, is that's dead. Right. That, that's right. That, I think it's, it was... This, just come on, on to chess. Yes, I think this is the name, Cecil. He had a niece, Greta, yes, who was Greta. married to, Greta. That's, that's to a right. man with the wonderful name, Turwit Drake. Yes. He had a nephew, Nigel, who was an actor. And yeah. the other uh, nephew was Richard Rickman, who may I still think... be alive. I haven't found a death record for him. I know that he didn't get on with his three sisters. He didn't like them. And he would see them only once a year when they, every summer they used to go to London and stayed in a, they rented a, a flat in Hill Street. And he used to see them for one, one day. They would have lunch together and that was it. But he still seemed to use the sister's address when he was traveling back and forth to England. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Right. Thank you so much for all that. Well, no, thank you for the thank you. lecture. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for bringing all this back. Uh, it's been so long. Yeah. I think about it. I'm not going to make me go open the drawers in the research center of the museum tomorrow and start checking what was left, what's Good. left there from Hal. <laughs> Keep me posted on whatever you find. <laughs> well, now we, we know much, much more about him, about his life before coming to Cyprus. So perhaps we can read the, his papers better and uh, hopefully and informed about it. Mm. Anyone else got any questions for me? 
Freddie, could I just ask you a question? This Pamela O'Neill. Uh, as the name suggests, Blackhall, but it is English. Uh, did they come into Ireland? Is it a family who came into Ireland and in, from England? And in what century? Yes, 1667 was the first grant of lands that he found in County Limerick. And he described them as Cromwellian landed gentry. Um, so I think the land was rewards for services to Cromwell in the, in the army. So it came in that way. And uh, a, a, a lot of the people they're married to also have English surnames. On your chart, a, a great deal of them are English oh, there's, surnames. There's, there's a, great, a great mixture. There's, um, sorry, I'll share my screen again in a yeah. second, so if I can. Uh, share screen. Share. So that you can see the pedigree chart again. And there's the pedigree chart. So yes, Thorne is probably an English name. And certainly he wrote at one stage, he thought she was a Catholic and then discovered she wasn't. But McMahon is very much Irish. The Butlers were Normans who were in Ireland for a long time. The McNamara's is very Irish. And there's a mixture of everything there. We can't think of... Yes, uh, Stan but, Seymour, Lambert, Forster, and so yeah. on. And were they... Um, were, what part of England were they coming from? Oh, I think they were all in Ireland for many generations. Um, I, mm. couldn't, I couldn't tell. In, in, Did you say in, Devon? In what you said? The black the black holes came from Devon. Yes. Devon. Yes. Yes. But where the the Lamberts or the Seymours or the Thorns came from, I've no yes. idea. I'm afraid. And uh, it's interesting to see that this background of English Catholics living in England in Ireland. Um, you know, you, you, you can see the kind of the religion and so on. So obviously they were Catholics at the end, though they might have been Church of Ireland originally. Yeah, well, I imagine there were many mixed marriages on that pedigree chart. And yes, for, for whatever so. reason, both of his parents ended up being Catholic and yes. he was raised Catholic. But there was... It's, it's the way that happens. And the Barrington family is so famous. And they, um, Barrington's in Limerick, they were also very much in County Leash. They had an estate in County Leash, yes, uh, Jonah right. Barrington. And those came from County Leash. Um, it's probably all the same family, isn't it? They're very well documented. Mark Tierney was actually involved. The old Limerick Journal brought out a special Barrington edition, probably about yes. 30 years ago, with lots of articles on different branches of the Barrington family. Mm. It's fascinating, uh, Paddy. And uh, do you continue the good work that, that Hal Blackhall started with, with the family tree? Well, I'm one of those people who doesn't take his advice and waits until things are perfect before daring to publish them. <laughs> so I've published very little, but I do my own research, yes. Yes, yes. It's a fascinating subject. And you were mentioning something called 2022 about, um, what is it, gathering together the lost records or trying to get duplicates of the lost records of 1922. Yes, what is that's, that project? A, that's a project based at Trinity College. Yes. Um, run by academics in all sorts of departments. Actually, the guy who was the lead researcher was also a mountaineer who died climbing Mount Everest a year or two ago. Oh. But the work is continuing on. Um, I guess the vision is what we want to see. Um, oh, yes. It's an all-Ireland and international collaboration working together. We will launch a virtual record treasury for Irish history, an open access virtual reconstruction of the record yes. treasury destroyed in 1922, combining historical research, archival discovery and technical innovation offers a lasting and meaningful legacy from the decade of centenaries, democratizing access to invaluable records, illuminating seven centuries of Irish history. I guess Isn't that's that wonderful. A, a virtual image make... of what it looked like. And the, the really ironic thing is that all these records were in a fireproof uh, repository. Oh. But the, the bomb went off inside the fireproof repository. Oh. And right. The only material which survived were the papers that were out in the reading room that readers had been consulting <sighs> before the occupation because they were on the other side of the fireproof barrier. Hmm. Ah. So we, we lost all the 19th century Irish census returns. And somewhere, hopefully, in Sir Hal's papers, we might find that he had transcribed some of the Blackhall and Clancy's 
census returns from 1821 or 31 or 41 or 51, but I haven't come across those yet. Uh, thank you so much. It's very, it's very fascinating you. that your explanation is very fascinating. And thank you very much, Paddy, for a, a very, very interesting talk. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, much appreciated. I found out something to put my picture on. Yeah. Hello, hello. You've got to do the test. This is Petros uh, Floridis, who is who is uh, one of one of uh, Paddy Waldron's former lecturers in Trinity College. I think his connection may not be great, but Petros, oh there you are, Petros, please. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Can yes. Yes. yes perfectly. Me? Well, first of all, I like to congratulate uh, Paddy for a thoroughly researched. A beautifully delivered lecture. It seems that my lectures to party did not go um, uh, were not wasted. <laughs> he is continuing the great tradition. Um, I, for me, this lecture is very moving because I come from a village very, very close to Kyrenia. Well, it's a very family um, lived, I believe. And my village is Lapithos, Rida and Costa. Yes, of you know, it, it's a beautiful, it's a be beautiful village. Beautiful. It's a beautiful village, which unfortunately I cannot visit very easily these days. Yeah. But my dream is that one day before I pass away, I shall be able to visit my beautiful village so. and especially the St. Hilarion castle. Awesome. Yes. The view from that castle is the best one I have ever seen and I'm sure it must be one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. It under inspired your, Walt Disney. Under your feet is Kyrenia with the lemon groves and all. Yes. And the further to the west is my lovely village, Lapithos. Yes. Thank you very much, Paddy. Thank you, Petrus. It's good my to question, see you again. My question is, after congratulating you on your lovely lecture, really very fascinating, um, is the jump from mathematics to genealogy a big one or not? Not at all. I have got into genetic genealogy, and that is where your lectures have really paid off, because being a mathematician and a statistician cool. is enormously helpful, especially in that side. Well, I, was, I also do little calculations pointing out everyone has royal descents, because I can think very easily. Ten generations back, we all had two to the power of ten, 1,024 ancestors. Mm -hmm. Twenty generations back, we had 1,024 by 1,024, which is roughly a million. Thirty generations back, we have a billion slots to fill in our family tree. Mm -hmm. And there weren't a billion people around 900 years ago, so we're all related. And as a mathematician, you know, I have to point that out to other genealogists. Paddy, I didn't know at the time you were in my classes that you come from such a distinguished uh, family. You simply are the loser to already shining family. So, Thank you. you know, congratulations. I enjoyed it thoroughly. I'm sorry uh, I couldn't get on your screen before, but thank you very much, Paddy. Thank you very much for all you told me. And if I if I can send a message to my lovely island through Rita and Costas, please give my little island a huge uh, oh. no, a, a huge hug. A huge oh. hug, if you could. Indeed. I love we, we it. Hope, we hope to see you here. Thank you. <clears throat> the, the one thing I didn't do, which Petrus used to do in the middle of his lectures, 
was to give the students a cigarette break so that he could go out and have his smoke. <laughs> between, I think that was in the middle of a double quantum mechanics lecture or something. Yeah. Well, that's news to me. That's news to me because people still come to me after 40, 50 years and they did talk about my dynamics lectures. And especially, they never forget the treatment of how a spin, a spinning top, the dynamics of it is so fascinating. And I'm, they, they still know and talk about it. I must be very happy to hear that. Good, good. Oh, um, yes. Thank you very much. Here it is. <clears throat> if there are no further questions, I'd like to, on behalf of all of you uh, around the world, to thank uh, Paddy Walton for a really fascinating lecture. And you can see what he says about the, the fact that we are all related. Here we are all looking, you know, there's, 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 there were up to 47 people looking in on, on, on Paddy's talk during the evening. Uh, from from all over the world, from Cyprus, from Australia, from North America, <laughs> and some from Ireland even, and uh, we all thoroughly enjoyed it, Paddy. You you have you know you have you revealed a whole new world to us, and we're very very grateful to you. We are very very much indebted to you, and it was fascinating also to to see that our founding president Petros Floridis has a connection with you through his through his lecturing in Trinity College. It's only almost a year ago. You mentioned that um, Sir Hal Blackall had been uh, awarded an honorary LLD, Doctorate in Laws, by Trinity College. It's almost uh, exactly one year ago, on the 17th of January, that a certain Prokopis Pavlopoulos was awarded an honorary uh, Doctorate in Law by Trinity College. And many of you will remember going to the exam hall, the Public Theatre in Trinity, and hearing uh, a wonderful presentation in, in Latin of President uh, Pavlopoulos, um, and his reply in Greek. It was a wonderful occasion uh, with wonderful organ music, a gorgeous speech in Latin, and a wonderful speech in Greek in response, in modern Greek in response, uh, and with, with great benefit of a, a simultaneous Ooh. translation. It was a marvellous occasion, and it was the last state visit, in fact, that President Pav Pavlopoulos made. Who were we to know that the whole year after that, we will be more or less enclosed because of COVID. <laughs> so we have had an extraordinary year, just as we've had this evening an extraordinary lecture. And I'd like to uh, proceed now to uh, something which we have introduced over the last few years in the Irish Hellenic Society, uh, in, 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 physically in the last two years. But this is a first this time because we are going to be introducing something uh, virtually for the first time. And I'd like to ask uh, Stella Xanopoulou, who is the president. Mm -hmm. First of all, she is the person yeah. responsible for yeah, cooking yeah. something called a virtual vasilopita. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will be moving my camera over to show you the virtual vasilopita. But perhaps perhaps um, it's, it's called after St. Basil, Vasilis. Pita is the word from which we get pizza. So vasilopita is a St. Basil's cake. And perhaps, Stella, you could explain a little bit about what a St. Basil's cake is and its significance in Greek life for those of us who don't go to Greece so much in the month of January or February. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you, Paddy. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, we had decided with um, Pamela O'Neill, the, the previous president of the Irish Hellenic Society, to start doing the Vasilopita, I think. It wasn't, isn't that right, Pamela? Yes, um, absolutely. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, so uh, since um, uh, following the tradition that the uh, other um, uh, Greek scene as members of the Irish Hellenic Society uh, used to cook uh, Greek food and bring it along when that was allowed. Um, so I decided to follow the, the, that tradition uh, and at least start doing the Vasilopita. And because every single organization uh, in Greece, every single household will have that uh, pie cut. So in, in the households, uh, we will have us on uh, New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. 
more in New Year's Eve than New Year's Day. But, and then the uh, organization's official bodies, they will cut their own pie. So um, from, uh, you know, a football club to, um, to the, the parliament to every single organization uh, will have their own uh, Vasilopita then during um, cut officially in official ceremony uh, during uh, January, February, March, even April sometimes if it's not Easter, uh, just depending on when suits. Um, so it's a very, it's maybe the only a tradition that um, is uh, followed by every single organization and every single household. Uh, so uh, we said with Pamela that we'll start uh, doing it exactly because um, of that uh, official status it, it has in uh, uh, in Greece and um, and Cyprus um, and and uh, for. Um, we decided to, I spoke to Paddy about it. I said, are you not going to do Vasilopita this year? And so I suggested I'll uh, bake it. I'll, <laughs> uh, I'll bring it, uh, wear masks and all to, to his uh, house. And uh, we got a, a, a Cypriot flag there. You can, you can tell. Yes. And I even uh, got a, um, a Cypriot coin from my coin collection. So Paddy wanted us, uh, to celebrate Cyprus uh, exactly because this lecture is um, about, uh, uh, you know, a union between Ireland and Cyprus. So we said we'll do that. So um, we, I tried to find a modern coin, but I couldn't. Uh, even the Cypriot ambassador, I asked around for a modern uh, Cypriot coin, but I couldn't uh, find one. So I got one of my collection, uh, which is pre-Euro uh, uh, coin. So I, I think Paddy uh, likes it very much. He will show us. So um, we'll start, I don't think. Uh, so the idea is that Paddy, being the president of the Irish Hellenic yeah. Society, so IHS stands for Irish Hellenic Society. And, and, um, and so Paddy will start cutting the, the pieces and we will. I will be calling the name of each of the uh, attendees there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we'll see who will get the lucky coin. So we're we're going to go with um, yeah. He's cutting it now in the in the big uh, pieces. So we, yeah, we normally do the sign sign of the cross. So we, we normally do the sign of the cross. Yeah, not not always. We yes, yeah, some families do, um, but not everybody. But anyway, so that's uh so, Paddy, are you going to cut it? How are you going to? Are you going to st start cutting it into what? Yes, Forty something? Yes. How, how many? Yeah. Yes. Yes. In, so um, we we so we, 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 we might we might we might get some help from some of the math mathematicians in the audience, such as uh, <laughs> <laughs> Petros Floridis and Paddy Waldron. <laughs> so the first piece, the first piece in my family, anyway. So the first piece was going to San Basil, um, all the time. So you. And then I'll take out Saint Basil's piece in that case. Uh, are you taking out some Basil yeah, piece? Yeah, okay. Yes, yes. Saint Basil. Maybe come you here. <laughs> So, <laughs> and then the second piece we'll do to the Irish Hellenic Society. As I know, we don't have a house, let's say, but for for, for today is your house, buddy. Okay. Very good. So, all right. So then the third piece. Um, in my household, we, it will, we will always go to the most honorary or the, the eldest person. So uh, we'll go, I think we'll go to Petros Floridis as a founding mm -hmm. member of the Irish Hellenic Society. <laughs> Petros? Our founding um, president, yes, yes. Our founding president. Uh, who is the eldest in the Irish Hellenic Society, Paddy? I suspect it's Dimitris. Is Tsuros. Dimitris yeah. or... Is, or who won last Dimitri. year? Is it? Is it Dimitris? Okay. <laughs> so then the next piece is Dimitris Tsouros. That's yours there, Dimitris. Thank you. <laughs> but you have to check if there is a coin. 
Uh-huh. Under under the when uh-huh. you cut them, yes. Okay. So turn them around. Okay. Yes, you have to okay. check if there is a coin. No, but, there's nothing. Okay. No, 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 not yet, not yet. Okay. No. So um, our our um, guest uh, patron uh, Waldron. Paddy or Patrick? Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, sorry, Patrick. Patrick Waldron. Mm-hmm. I'm getting very hungry now. Mm. <laughs> it is actually nice, but I have to say the house smelled very well. <laughs> then we go to, uh, I think we should go to um, to Cyprus to read uh, Severis mm-hmm. and Costas. Thank you. Chronia Pola, Kali Chronia. Chronia Pola. Να γλιτώσουμε από την πανδημία, ναι. Yeah, that's from the, from the pandemic. Να φάμε βασιλόπιτα από κοντά. I don't... Should we, go, should we finish with our... Um, with the international guests? Should we go to... Is it Liverpool and Australia? I don't remember yeah. the names. John, 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 Blackall. John Blackall in Liverpool. That's right. Okay, John Blackall in Liverpool. Thank you. Yeah, no Danny. coin yet, okay. No coin yet, no, no. Australia, sorry. Um, I so I have, we have to... A, we have Anne Morahan in Australia. I think Nick Redden has left us, who was there earlier. No, I'm not finding any coin. Okay, so <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, so I will continue. Who else is uh, international friends? Are there more international friends? Have we seen it? I see Eileen Harvey there in Chicago. Okay, Eileen Harvey from Chicago. Ooh, that sounded like a. Eileen has a very strong Chicago accent. Chicago accent. So. So. Uh, am I, I have I finished, finished Os- Os- Anne Os- from Australia? From Australia? Yes. yes? Hmm. We're continuing. Mm-hmm. Yes. So yeah. I'll I'll go now as I see the names on the screen mm. if we mm-hmm. finish. So we we'll go Val Duffy. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, I've, I've got a star. Thank you, Pamela. You've done Pamela, yeah. Thodoris should I said Thodoris from Crowdlink that he's behind all, all that. You? Theos Yutus, yes. I see Vespina there. Vespina Floridis. Vespina, yes. Chronia Pola, Kali Chronia. Chronia Pola, Vespina. Paddy, are you looking for the coin? Oh, every time, every time, yes. Okay, yes, yes. good, yes, yes. good. Uh, Michael O'Connell. Yep. Ooh. Happy New Year, Michael. All the way from County Clare. On the way from the Banner County. Very Bartel. nice. From Mahogod. So the person that is the uh, whose piece will have the coin supposed to be the lucky, you know, it's just good luck um, for the year. So what is going to happen to the pieces is I'm going to get them back, and my um, and Shay and my daughter are going to eat them. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good. System. We leave we leave some, I think. I might bring. Some them uh, over to Dimitris Turos and uh, hand them over the window um, and um, of course there will be uh, some left at Paddy's uh, and Joe's house so um, so Michael Cohen, Patricia Waldron yes. Paddy you keep cutting that you cut three more so Patricia Waldron mm-hmm. uh, Phil Ryan and Mary mm-hmm. Kelleher excellent Yeah. Okay, so this yes. is Mary, Michelle Mary, Mary, Sindal. Mary. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Mary yes. Gelleher. She got the little coin. Yes. Yes, there's a the little <laughs> yeah. coin Mary. there. Mary Kelleher. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations. One second. Yeah. 
Hello. Hola. Mary, are you going to put your video on to so we can see you? <laughs> Uh, I, I'm not familiar with the. I'm familiar with the hearing rather than the seeing. We have to see you. You won the coin. We'll give the coin to somebody else if you don't put your video on. <laughs> I, th I think Stella, 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 yes? Stella. This is Deirdre. Um, I think that when I try to put the video on, it says your host has disabled your video. Yes, yeah, that oh. happened to me. So ah. maybe other people can't get on either. No, we can't get on. I, oh. I, I'm the same oh. boat, yeah. Oh, no, no, okay. Can't get on. No, 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 can't get on. Could that be fixed? All right. So. Too close, oh, too close. Yeah, my name is Anna. Adi, do you want to talk about the coin, what the coin says? I'm just, I'm just, the, the coin on one side says Kipros, which is Cyprus in Greek. Cyprus in English. Oh, there and, it is. I'm and Kip, Kipris, Kipris in Turkish. And it's, it's from 1998, and it has the arms of Cyprus. And then on the other side, it has uh, Europa uh, being taken away on the bull. And I think this, this is a pre-Euro coin. But um, mm. the, the same, the same uh, motif appears on one of the Cyprus uh, Euro coins as well, I think. Yes, it's 50, 50 cents. Yeah. 50 or 2? No, 50. It, it, 50 Five that's... zero. Yeah. Yeah, five zero. It's fifty cents. But on the, I think, I think the same motif appears also on the on the two euro coin. Yeah. Yes. More recently. Okay. I can't remember. Well, what congratulations, time. congratulations, happy new year to the winner. So, folks, I think we'll wind it up for this evening. I'd like to thank Paddy Waldron on your behalf for a most fantastic lecture, which opened our eyes to so many things. It was such an international event. And he had so many facts at his fingertips. And I learned so much from you, Paddy. Thank you so, so much. And I look forward on another occasion to listening about your whole new project of, of, the, of, of DNA genealogy, which is also totally fascinating and, and uses your, your mathematical background as well. Thank you on behalf of each and every one of us.